So welcome to the first um, workshop in the Gene Educator series happening tonight. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm Nancy Coddington. I'm the Director of Science Content at WSKG Public Media, and we are the local NPR and PBS affiliate across the Southern Tier. And then today in this workshop, you're going to learn about resources that are available from PBS Learning Media that cover topics such as gene testing and direct to consumer testing. Those are our topics for today. Uh, you're going to have time to collaborate with your colleagues to determine which resources will be most effective to use in your classroom. And we have a great guest speaker who's joining us today, Dr. Heather Fumera. She's Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at Binghamton University. And she's gonna share the latest information coming out of her lab over at Binghamton University. I just want to take a moment to thank the partners that helped to make this possible. Um, this was supported with some grant funding from uh, WETA, W-E-T-A. Uh, I'd like to thank Maureen Smith at uh, BOCES with the Professional Learning and Innovation Center at Broomtega BOCES, uh, SUNY Cortland, the Science Teachers Association of New York State, Stannis, New York State Master's Teachers Program, and WSKG. Tonight, our presenters are going to be Maureen Smith, who is also the director of our Southern section of Stannis. And if you don't know what Stannis is, well, I would love to tell you more about that, uh, maybe in the, in the chat. That's your local science uh, group that keeps you connected with things that are happening, not only in the state, but um, in, your, in your discipline. We have Jessica Schindler. She's a biology teacher at Green Central School District. She's also um, a subject area representative for our Stannis section in biology. Erin Deegan is a biology teacher at Bainbridge Guilford Central School District and myself. Just a couple things for housekeeping. Uh, I see every, most everybody has their videos on, so thank you, that's great. Um, but please feel free, if you need to turn your video off, um, please do so. Please do stay on mute uh, for most of the presentation. We are gonna go into breakout rooms so if you can um, turn your camera on when you're in the breakout room, just so that you can participate, that would be really great. And I'm gonna pop in the link, oh, Maureen already just popped it in, into the chat. Uh, this is a link to the slide deck that we are going to be using tonight. Uh, there are some notes on here um, and some yes. additional links, everything that we're gonna be covering. So, so big. Mm -hmm. this one. And I just have a couple more items and then I'm gonna turn it over. Um, I have some free goodies for everybody. And so we are using the sign-in list to pick names and I'm going to get with Don Panicone and Maureen Smith to um, find out, um, to be able to email you if you did win a prize. So I'm gonna ask that in your, when you did sign in, if your name doesn't match your registration, can you go ahead and please rename yourself uh, you can do that by clicking on your image. There's usually those three little dots. You can click on that and choose to rename yourself. Please make sure that your name matches however you registered for the program. Uh, just makes it a little bit easier so you can get credit for, the, for attending today and also for winning some of these prizes. And the prizes are, um, I have 23andMe DNA kits. So some of you lucky folks are gonna win those tonight. And then I also have some DVDs of the gene, the full four hours uh, available as well. So we'll be sending those out. And then I've got some pencils I think kicking around in my office. As I mentioned, we do have a special guest with us tonight, Dr. Heather Fumera. She is the Associate Professor of Biological Sciences. And uh, Maureen, can you go ahead and put the link to her lab in the chat? That would be cool. Um, so Dr. Heather uh, Fumera, she's gonna be with us all night. She is here already. Uh, so she is going to be joining the breakout rooms with us. Um, so if you have some questions, uh, she will be probably watching that chat as well, but she will be able to interact and, and uh, talk with us. And then the last half an hour of today, she's actually going to be giving us a presentation, as I mentioned earlier. And the last thing I'm gonna go over before I turn this over to Erin is that all of the resources that we are going to be using today are available on PBS Learning Media. And PBS Learning Media is a 
free uh, resource for educators that is available for uh, if you're part of BOCES, there's a single sign on that you can you can sign on. Otherwise, you can just create a free account. And I hope everybody did do that before today, just so you can have, if you want to navigate over into the site, it's a little bit easier. Everything we're showing you today is pretty turnkey that you can bring right into your classroom and be able to utilize. So we wanted to make this uh, super easy, super friendly uh, to be able to bring right into the classroom. And with so much online learning happening these days, I think some of these resources are really going to be fantastic with sharing with your students. And we're going to talk about how you are able to do that. So I've said a lot of stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do at this point is I am going to turn things over to Erin Deegan. She is going to walk us through the first part of our workshop tonight. Okay, so um, there is a lot of material on uh, PBS Learning Media related to the gene. Um, so what we decided to do was utilize uh, the genetic testing and tr instructional materials to introduce you to the website. Um, so what we wanted to do first is start with the uh, direct to consumer testing um, and show you some of the um, different things they've done to make this really easy for teachers to get started using it. So we're going to start by going to the website and just checking out uh, the, some of the teacher materials that are available for us. We're going to start right under the video. Um, it shows you, uh, or there's a link to standards. Um, so we're going to click on that and take you to the standards that are available. So in addition to the New York State standards, um, including how they match with our core curriculum, um, there's also national standards um, and the next generation science standards for to make it easy for you to see how this will fit into um, your instruction. Um, so that's kind of a nice handy tool uh, to tie everything together. Um, in addition to um, the standards, um, there's also short video clips that have already been modified from the gene, the documentary, the Ken Burns documentary. Um, we're not going to show you this entire video clip. Uh, we're going to start at six minutes in so that you can get a sense of what kind of material there is available just to introduce your topics with students, give you something to talk about. So I'm going to let Nancy go ahead and play that. Okay. Later, scientists would discover other processes that enabled humans and other higher organisms to generate such enormous complexity with only a modest number of genes. The DNA within each gene they found read whole or in part, producing different results. It's as if the exact same phrases and sentences that provide the instructions for making the legs of a chair could be rearranged to make the seat or the armrests. The reality of what those 20,000 genes are doing is in fact amazingly complicated. We haven't just got 20,000 different instructions. Well, many genes can be read in more than one way. From the same DNA sequence, you can read half of it or three quarters of it or turn it on at different points in your development. And that's what accounts for the amazing variety and why I don't look like kind of two thirds fly. I look like me. Of all the revelations about the human genome in the early 2000s, possibly the most surprising was that the genes themselves comprise only a very small part of it. All the focus was on the genes, the part of the human DNA that encodes the proteins. But it turned out that information was only a little more than 1% of all the genetic code. At first, scientists thought those other segments of DNA were useless detritus discarded across millennia of human evolution. But over time, they found that some of the sequences were actually switches that turn genes on and off. In the textbooks, you draw a picture with the body of the gene containing the protein information, and it takes up most of the picture. But in the genome, it looks like a tiny fraction of the whole. Turns out that there was a lot more information that wasn't the protein coding regions of the genome. 
it was regulatory regions scattered about the genome and it was three or four or five times as much information so the whole textbook picture was turned on its head still there are stretches of the human genome that seem to have no function old defunct genes scattered like shipwrecks on the ocean floor and vast, strange sections of repeating letters that seem to be remnants of viruses that long ago embedded themselves in our genome. More importantly, there are occasional errors, simple mistakes in copying, that can have catastrophic consequences. Okay, so these videos, again, are designed to provide context, um, background information, a place to start with all the materials that then um, are available for us as teachers. So on the right hand side of the screen, you see support materials for teachers. Um, and I just wanted to take a look at some of what is available there. So under um, under that material, there is a teacher guide. Um, and so that's right under using this resource. So if we click on that, um, each one of these lessons includes some sort of a lesson plan with links to the supporting materials built into the lesson plan. Um, those links can include additional readings, handouts, um, PowerPoint slides, slide, slide decks already put together. Um, oftentimes there's related vocabulary, um, as well as other related lessons that you can use. So this particular, um, teacher guide includes activities uh, like this slideshow that we can look at. Um, we can download a lot of these materials and then um, edit them. They're in a format that allows us to edit and modify for using specifically in our classrooms. Um, so if we look, for example, at the activity uh, section under the support materials, you'll see that the PowerPoint is there. And again, when we look at that PowerPoint, it's only a few slides, but it's designed to use it with um, your students right away. And it does have slide notes to use already built, uh, put together for you. Um, so talking points that you might wanna use while you're using the slide deck. Um, you can see if you go right down, yeah. <laughs> Right here? Yes. Yeah, right. It, it, it continues to elude me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we did have a question. I just wanted to pop in while I um, scroll before these. There's a question that um, are the videos only available on the website? They are available. This particular documentary, um, they don't allow for downloading. It's, it's a stream only, even though all the other materials can be downloaded. But you can share these directly from uh, learning media. There is a site that your students can use. Um, and it also works with the with the Google Classroom. So that was a question that came up in the chat. So I just wanted to address that. Okay, go ahead, Erin. Thank you for doing that. Um, so again, you saw she put up, um, it was nice that we were able to see the, the talking points that go with these slide decks. Um, again, it's a handy tool to kind of save some time. And then again, the, the way the slides are put together, it's designed really for classroom instruction. Uh, they are kept generally pretty short and uh, simple, and definitely it's easy to modify and put in any materials that you might wanna add um, or any slides that you wanna take out, you can very easily do that. So again, it's another really handy um, tool already there for us to access. Okay, so I wanna go back and look at some of the other features um, that are on this site. So over on the left hand side of the video, there is a share to Google Classroom link, which is really nice. Those of us that are living online this year, um, it does just make it easier to share the materials with your students. There are other ways as well to share it. And um, when you have the PBS Learning Media account, marking it uh, for your favorites is a really nice, um, a nice tool as part of this website. I also wanted to point out that you may also like, which is over on the right hand side. Um, and if you scroll down, they've linked other short video clips and materials that um, go along with the 
with the materials that you're looking at on this particular page. And so that's what I wanted to do next was jump to the introduction to genetics and medicine um, that kind of connects to moving on from testing to why we might test. So we're gonna go to that next section. Do you want me to pop back to the slideshow? Yeah, you can quick. Okay. You can look at. So under that, on that particular page, there's again, lots of support materials. We're gonna look at those support materials with you. Um, and then our goal is to show you how to use, actually use some of those support materials with your students by doing a jigsaw activity uh, with um, the participants uh, today. So um, when we look at the introduction to genetics and medicine materials, um, under the support materials, they're a little bit more simplified than what I showed you with the lesson plan on the first one. So again, under the support materials for teachers, um, under using this resource, this one just has some quick teaching tips. If we click on that. And I kind of liked this because it just was a quick note, um, not a huge long lesson plan, but just here's a quick how you could use this in your classroom. Um, they give you some ideas, not only for when you're directly or when you're actually physically in the room with students, but also for uh, synchronous classes. If you're doing remote instruction this year, which uh, I think most of us are, um, it's nice to have those teaching tips and not have to figure that all out yourself. So, and again, it was nice. That's just kind of a nice quick um, tool. Before you move on with that, Erin, there was mm -hmm. a question in the chat asking about the share to Google Classroom. Um, Derek says that he generally just adds to the, the link to the PBS webpage in his Google assignment. He's wanting to know what the advantage of using that button as an option is. I honestly haven't tried using that button um, yet to know what the advantage is. I believe it's just going to create the link for you and potentially simplify it. But I was going to say, let's try it and see if Nancy wants to do that. I'm not letting me. I don't know waiting for Google don't Classroom. Have, yeah, if you don't have a classroom, you probably won't be able to do it. Um, sorry, I should have played with that a little bit <laughs> to see what the advantage is. I think it's, it's a nice way to be able to, um, oops, I didn't want to move that, to if you are using Google Classroom, um, it will provide that link and assign or share. So similar to here, you can share um, this with your with your colleagues. You can also assign it so it sends the link off. It does look a little bit different for your students. For example, they don't see the support materials for teachers. They don't care about standards. So that information isn't, isn't shared with them. So they have a little bit of a different uh, view. Right, and and somebody uh, Libby also added um, it. It does create it as an assignment, um, which is a little different um, than just posting the link yourself. So, I think it'll put it together as an assignment for you. And then you can see if your kids have done it. I think once it interfaces with the Google Classroom. Right. Right. So then um, under the activity description. So if we click there. Um, again, it goes through a description of how the activity will work. Again, this is a little more simplified than the whole lesson plan that we showed you in the on the first page. Um, so again, it gives you an explanation of um, how you might use it, what the activity looks like, and then links to um, the video clip and uh, um, one of the readings that is provided to the students in the actual handout that we're going to show you. Um, so this actually links you right to that particular um, op-ed uh, that Angelina Jolie wrote. There's a version of this um, that they use on the handout that we're gonna actually have you utilize um, when we do the jigsaw activity. Okay, so um, that's the next thing I wanted to look at was um, if we hit the plus sign next to support materials for use with students that should create a drop down for us where we can see what those materials are. Um, so I mentioned before they do have usually vo vocabulary lists created and this one does have a vocabulary list. Um, there is some background reading that you can use with your students that's up above that. Um, and again, this gives you some nice basic vocabulary. Um, good quality definitions. Um, and we're gonna look at the handout. 
So what we want to do is actually use this activity to model the kinds of materials that are already put together uh, for us to use with our students. So the handout first asks the students in the directions to start with a do now, which is watching the clip from the PBS documentary. This one's only about four minutes long, so we are going to show this to you. I'm going to let Nancy keep scrolling, though, so you can see. The goal of this is that there are three different reasons um, that we might, a person who's healthy might want genetic testing. So that are provided on this particular handout, along with a short passage for the students to read. Um, and there's a, there's a question um, on the last page related to each um, of the particular reading passages. So what we're gonna do is show you that video clip um, and then we're going to have you choose one of the passages that you're interested in reading and answer the question related to the passage that you chose. So question number one goes with passage one, two with passage two, and three with passage three. Um, but let's watch the video clip first, get that background information in context, and then we'll explain how you're actually going to answer the questions. And right before I play this, I want to just mention that um, I am using a, the share screen feature. When you're doing with this with your students, you can certainly make um, the video go to the entire screen. I'm not doing that just because I wanted you to see the other items that were around there. Stories like Letty Lassiter's demonstrate that genetics can now predict and change the course of some diseases. It's still unclear exactly how many genetic diseases can be predicted and headed off before they develop. The complexity of the genome and the difficulty of accurately assessing the influence of environmental factors present formidable problems. But the example of breast cancer screening illustrates what will become possible. The discovery of the two main genes associated with familial breast cancer in the 1990s, BRCA1 and BRCA2, was a major breakthrough. But at least a third of families with a strong risk of the disease don't have mutations in those two genes. So a new approach was needed. We have begun to decipher the multitudes of genes that cause the risk for a woman who doesn't have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Now you could potentially screen that woman because now you know that she has a heightened risk. You could screen that woman more aggressively for breast cancer and intervene early. Genetic sequencing is likely soon to become a major part of disease diagnosis and prevention. In fact, it may be a regular part of a doctor's visit. This kind of individualized genetic screening has been given a name, precision medicine. Precision medicine is the idea of bringing together everything you know about the individual, their inheritance, their genome, but also their environment, their health behaviors, their lifestyle, their diet, and optimizing a means of preventing disease, or if disease occurs, a means of treating it in a way that's not one size fits all. It's actually precise for that person. At the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, a team under director Francis Collins has launched an ambitious precision medicine project. They are enrolling a million people whom they plan to track for decades. People walk around with wearable sensors that keep track of what's happening to them. They answer lots of questionnaires about their health. And over the course of many years, we are going to learn more than we had ever dreamed of knowing about what it is that plays out in people's actual health experience. Some of this may be the ability to do prediction of future illness so that you modify your lifestyle in a way that's specific for you. Some of it may be early detection. If you do get sick and you need a drug, what drug? What dose? There are more than 100 drugs for which we actually know that your response to that will depend on something we could measure in your DNA. This is no small undertaking, and it's not going to happen overnight. But it is clearly going to be a theme of medicine in the 21st century. But even as the age of personal genetic data arrives, so does an old specter, eugenics. If an individual's genetic makeup is made readily available, 
Will it be used to discriminate in employment or insurance? Or to make subjective judgments about different races or ethnicities? Genetics really, because of it being uh, the sort of core of who we are, of course gets mobilized into ideas about human perfection and a kind of fantasy about being able to um, perfect ourselves and perfect our children and our children's children. It is a trap that has ensnared even pioneers in the field. James Watson has appalled the scientific community with a series of unfounded remarks about the genetic differences between races and genders. Okay, so now's the time when we're going to ask you to participate and read those passages, one of those passages, um, and answer the questions in the jigsaw. So I think Maureen is working on putting the link to the passages in the chat right now. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jess to explain how to use Jamboard. Hey, hi everyone. So some of you have probably used Jamboard. Some of you may not have. Some of you may never even heard of it. Um, I take a lot of classes from Maureen and she loves Jamboard and I've started to fall in love with it myself. So um, just a couple of different things. Um, Maureen's also going to put the link to the Jamboard in um, the chat. So when you're done reading the passages that you've chosen, um, we want you to pick the um, slide of the Jamboard that um, is, has the information that you read. So the first um, slide has the stuff about Angelina Jolie, the second one um, and the third one, they kind of, they go in order. Um, I don't know um, if we can, can we pull up the Jamboard, Nancy? We can, <clears throat> excuse me, give me one second here. I was working on breakout rooms. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good. Okay. So if you've never um, made or used a Jamboard before, um, they're really neat in the fact that you can do something like this um, with this particular slide um, where you put all your own stuff on there. And then what the kids do is they're going to click on um, the piece that allows them to add um, a um, sticky note and um, they can write all their stuff on the sticky note and then they that it comes onto the jam board and then you start moving the stuff around. Um, and, or you could just have a blank blank sheet. I mean, you could do whatever you want with that. The thing that I don't like about the jam board is that whatever you stick on here, anybody you give this link to can click on those things and move them around. Um, so you kind of have to put some, some ground rules down for your kids as to what it is you want them to do and what you want, don't want them to do. Um, but you can, you can make these things interactive. You can make them, um, real like, so that all the kids are putting stuff on there at the same time, you can assign them so that they're only doing their own, um, and each one. So, um, Nancy, if you go to the next slide up at the top, um, it gives you the different, um, slide pieces. And so you guys are going to only fill out the information on your particular slide. Um, we're going to give you about, I think we're about eight minutes, um, to go ahead and pick this, the, um, story you want to read. Um, and then you're going to pick the slide that has your, your information. You're going to go ahead and add in, um, your thoughts on it. And you're just going to, your little, um, piece is going to come up into the, the left-hand corner, and then you're just going to move it to wherever it is that you need to. A couple things in the chat here. We've got some jam. Oh, board. that's a nice little, that's a nice little trick. Yeah. Um, so in, in or, Mark says that in order to avoid kids from moving things on purpose or on accident, because it can be done on accident, uh, create a text box that covers the whole slide and that prevents them from moving things around. So that's a, that's a, a really good trick um, to make use of. Um, like I said, there's things that I'm only just learning how to do. So, but you'll see right now, somebody's already putting some stuff and you can move it. You can make it bigger, you can change the background, um, you can make them smaller. I always tell the kids um, that they can move their own stuff, but they can't move anybody else's stuff. And if anything gets deleted, it's because I deleted it. 
Um, and it's because it was inappropriate. So um, other than that, um, we just want you to go ahead and take a few minutes to read and um, start filling some of that stuff out. Are we gonna go into breakout rooms for this? Um, I don't think so, no. no. Okay, okay. Judy had a question about how do you assign a Jamboard to each student without having many, many different links? And um, Maureen has answered yeah, her. You, which is if you assign it on, on Google Classroom um, with a link, you have the option to be able to have everyone um, be able to manipulate it or it makes a, um, or to, to make one for each student. So if you don't want anybody but the one kid to be able to write stuff on there, you would make it so that they each get their own copy. And then um, through Google um, Classroom, you can actually click on all of their stuff and just go between each, each one very easily actually um, to see what each kid um, has put in. You can actually even put your own sticky notes on there to send information back to them about what they did right or wrong or what you um, liked about what they were doing. Um, whereas if you do it so that everyone can write on it, um, once their um, sticky note is actually on, you can't tell who put it there, um, which is kind of sucky. But I actually made use of the Jamboard once um, for the entire class. Um, and it was good because everyone was on it at the same time and I was looking only at the one. So I could like talk them through things. Okay, somebody, somebody needs to cover this particular piece or we've got five of this one. Somebody needs to start um, taking your stuff out and put something else there or whatever. And it, it works really well for especially those who are in person. Um, but it's also just a really good way for those kids who are at home to kind of become involved with some of those things. So that's great. And thank you everybody for putting in, you know, how you're using it. Um, Nicole, that's super helpful. Making an original and share the view only link. Kids make their own copies and turn it in in using Canvas. So that that's a great uh, tip as well. And then also because you guys have the link um, to all of this, you guys are going to be able to see everybody's information um, and stuff and um, um, we'll be able to have access to, to that. So we're not going to spend time going over what everybody else has, has written, which we would have done at some point, you know, at a different time in the interest of time. You guys have access to all of this and can see what people are putting in there. Thank you for everybody who's put your sticky note in here already. I think we have about four more minutes or so that we're going to give you guys to be able to to work on putting some stuff out there. Am I right with that, Maureen and Erin? I have about four more minutes um, to throw some stuff out there and then we're going to move on. I added my own. <laughs> This is great, everybody. Thank you so much. Keep posting your thing. This page is getting a lot of work. One of the other things that I would um, recommend also um, is I did this with a readings that I had kids do and they had 
specific things they were supposed to put it on. And yet they didn't take notice of which sheet they were on. So really making sure that your kids um, know which um, one they're supposed to put their stuff on or, or their information makes no sense. Kevin said he had trouble reading the uh, op-ed piece. Yeah, he should be able to. If he opens up the handout, he can read the section that they placed in the handout. So yeah, they've cut those slices out that we want right. us to, are specific to that. Yes. Do we have a link for that handout again? We, yeah, we could do that. It's in the chat. Let me see if I can find it. I don't know, a couple of people have been kicked out and came back in, so they lose, yeah. they Let lose things too. There again. And just to remind you that um, when you have the link for the slides, a lot of these links are also embedded in the slides or they are in um, the, the note portion of the slides, just so that you have this information when we are done with this workshop. Oh, I see what Kevin is saying, the, that article, is they give you a snippet of it, but to actually read the whole article, you do have to click on it. So, and I have a New York Times sub subscription, so I didn't realize you had to. Can you get enough from the passage? I think you can. <clears throat> and learning media is not in cahoots with the, <laughs> the Times. I run into that problem with your time all the time at time as well, unfortunately, mm -hmm. Judy. So if you guys want to put your last finishing touches up, we're going to slide over to um, the next um, slide deck or the next uh, thing on the PowerPoint. Sure. I will pop back over there. While everybody's finishing up their last thoughts. I'm just going to shrink my window first before I pop back over there. I thought you were going to have like a song to go along with the jam, jam board time. Jam board <laughs> Sorry. time. <laughs> I was just having when I was unmuted, my dogs weren't barking. So <laughs> usually that's the only time they bark. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Nancy, you want to go ahead and go on to the, the next slide. So we're, um, there are also some additional resources. Um, that are out there. Um, we've got um, the gene strike and some supported materials. Um, Nancy just put that into um, the chat for you guys if you guys want to move on over to that so we can take a look at it. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Thanks. I've got so many things open at this point, I'm lost. <laughs> okay. So we were going to um, watch this uh, video here first, the gene strike, if you wanna go ahead and press play on that one. Yeah, I'm not hearing any sound for that. Okay. And I'm seeing something. Let me go ahead and do a. I think I'm having a little bit of internet instability. Give me a moment. Right, well, while you're working on that, if you'll notice there on the right hand side, once again, um, there's all the same kind of things that what like Aaron was pointing out. Um, we've got some discussion questions that um, will go along with the the short little video. So it's always really nice to be able to show a um, quick little short video, but then you want kids to be able to participate with it and what was the purpose of it. So um, clicking on, on that will give you some discussion questions to go with it. And then underneath that, once again, there was also some um, vocabulary words and stuff that go with it. So the, the, the nice um, thing about this website is that there's just so many different um, parts and pieces that can 
can shoot you off in different directions and give you supported pieces um, with that. I want to go ahead and give that another try. I do. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, let's see right. if this works better. They're calling in a chemo strike. It's about time. That'll stop it. But sir, a chemo attack will destroy the whole town. The tumor has grown too big. We can't stop it. Chemo is our only chance of survival. Wait a second. They're holding the chemo. Too much collateral damage. They're sending in a precision strike team to do recon. Recon? There's no time. Chemo it now. Sir, we have better technology now. OK, we can get in behind enemy lines, decode the genes, and learn how it is attacking. I've lost a lot of cells, a lot of good cells, fighting this, this cancer. I can't lose another. Well, chemo might kill it, but it will definitely kill more cells, making it hard to fight again if the cancer comes back or if other enemies invade. I won't lose another one. Not one more cell. Brief me on this strike team. How does it work? One of our doctors sneaks into the tumor, nabs some DNA, and learns all the cancer secrets. Hmm. Well, different cancers have different vulnerabilities. So once the doctor hones in on the enemy's weak spot, a strike team is sent in, quietly, cleanly, and with no collateral damage. A precision strike. A precision strike. And it's not just about finding the enemy's weaknesses. Doctors can also look at a patient's genes to gather intelligence about the strengths of the troops. Well, then brief me. OK, situation cancer advancing. Now, instead of just sending out troops in a pill and hoping that it works, the doctor can do some recon to the patient's genes yeah. and see exactly what kind of troops will work best with the patient's genes to make sure they are using the best tactics. Well, why didn't we use this in the Great Respiratory War? We just weren't there yet. Well, let's get ready for the precision strike. Comms? Put in a call to the president. So you can see that they're just some nice little um, short clips, right? cartoon ones and stuff um, work just as nicely as, as the other ones do and the, the resources and stuff that go with it are just really nice um, little pieces to add and have kids really think about and, and try looking at things from a different perspective. Nancy, you want to go back to um, the PowerPoint? I do. So we have a, another question in the chat. Are the resources under you may also like only PBS learning media links or are they links to resources all over the internet and YouTube? So far, they've only taken me to resources that are within PBS learning uh, media. Nancy, I didn't know if you wanted to speak to that to make sure I wasn't misleading people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so well, we did have links that did you know take us to a, a larger article. Um, a lot, all of the content that's on PBS Learning Media has been vetted not only through PBS and the producers, but they also work with educators to make sure that it's appropriate for the classroom, but that it's also appropriate, um, you know, for your kids. So there are not links that go to YouTube or to different um, other media sites. If there is articles or additional resources, they really try to make sure that it's embedded in learning media so that when you pull it up, you either print it or you can share it directly with your students. You don't have to send them off to a different place because then we don't know where they're necessarily going after that. Um, you know, they really take uh, security and, and privacy issues very, very uh, seriously. So everything should be found right within the resources that you're looking for. And the nice thing about all of these materials is that you can um, take what's given to you and you can modify it to make it um, go up a couple grades or go down a couple of grades very easily um, with the, the materials and stuff that are, are present as well. Another great thing about learning media, if you're not familiar with it, is there are some tutorials on how to use some of the other assets that are in there that we're not going to get into tonight. So there, there is a quiz maker. Um, there is a tutorial on how to interface with Google Classroom. Um, there's ways to show you how to, to make this be a tool that's easier for you to use, you know, once you get it and have that little bit of a learning curve. 
Uh, but all of that's available in, in the in the help section as well, which is great. Uh, it's you know it's a it's a user friendly tool. So I think we're ready for the next slide. Oh, good, it's break time. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and take a quick five minute break, go go get something to drink, use the bathroom, whatever. Um, and then we're gonna do some breakout rooms when you guys all come back. Yes, and we are gonna stick to that five minutes. So please, please be do be mindful of that as we still have lots to do. So thank you. Nancy, did you get the room set up or do you want me to? Because I have it semi ready. I just have to click. I have them ready to go. You're the best. But I need to bring back my presenter list. I can't seem to, or my participation list. <laughs> there we go. Hey Jess, somebody wanted to say hi to you. Yay, hi there. I see that smile underneath that pacifier. Yes, I do. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's getting too big too fast. He's in 2T clothes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like all 14 month old is in 2Ts. <laughs> I love so, watching him on his uh, his bare rocking chair. He's a rocking great. horse. <laughs> there, there's that beautiful face. Hi, Hi buddy. <laughs> You're tall enough. Are you talking yet? Can you say hi? Uh... Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch. Don't touch. Thanks, Libby. I needed that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so we got about one minute left of break. He says, hi, Christina. Okay, now I need to go give him away. <laughs> 
Good luck with that. <laughs> that won't be as easy. <laughs> I agree with you, Heather. Cutest thing I've seen all day long. He's a sweetie. All right, Nancy, you think we're ready? Okay. Hopefully, I know not everyone is gonna toss cameras back on, which does make it a tad challenging to know if we're all back. But we are going to go ahead, as Jeff said before, a quick little break and go into breakout rooms. So we just drew a lot at you. Um, it's been a very short session really so far. And and we, we gave you a lot of resources. We talked about a lot of resources and we know that now you need a little bit of time to kind of dig through them and also talk because one of the other things we know is that there's not always a chance to do that during our normal work day. And so what we're going to do is um, put everybody in breakout rooms and they are gonna be random. So you should just get an invite to ask them to, or to join them. And what we want you to do is just have some conversation around how you might use these materials in your classroom and what different ideas you have that come into mind in regards to implementation. And so you'll see on the slide um, that Nancy has up, we do have another Jamboard because as Jeff mentioned, I do really like Jamboard. So we have another one in here for everyone to get to practice. And with that Jamboard, what we'd like you to do is just put a post-it of what you're thinking of how you might use these in the class, or if you're already using some of the PBS materials, you can share that information. And what we'd like you to do is you will see a breakout room when you get put into that room, you'll see a number. Pay attention to that number when you get put in there because that's the slide in the Jamboard that we're gonna have you put your notes on. Because it would be a lot if we had all of us working on one slide. And so if you're put into room one, slide one will be yours. If you're put into room nine, slide nine will be yours. Um, so we are gonna give probably about 15, 20 minutes to do that. And we'll all be jumping in and out to have some of that conversation with you as well. And if you have any questions, you can just request one of us to come into your room. Whenever you're ready, Nance. All right, here we go. Should I be jumping into this room that you assigned me, Nancy? If you want to jump in and check in and jump back out, totally up to you. Okay. Um, I figured yeah. I would leave you guys assigned and then you can always pop back out. Maureen, I see when I tried to put the, uh, oh, Libby's asking for help. What room is she in? She's in 12. Okay, I'll run to there. Thank you. Yep. All good? Yes, 
they must not have the slides open and they didn't have the link to the Jamboard anymore. Oh, yes. Okay. So that was easy. Um, and maybe. How was it to set up the rooms? Just out of curiosity. Oh, you've never done it, Jeff? It's so easy. Oh, yeah, I've done it before. I was just making sure if, there was, if it was the same. Okay, cool. Awesome. I didn't see a time a timer on there though. I missed that piece of it because like you can usually set a time to automatically close them out. Mm, I don't think so. You used to be able to. Hmm, I don't know. That would be new for me. Um, the one thing, Jeff, that you guys are going to want to probably think about um, oh. is like Jeff ended up taking over and doing my slide before the break because yeah. I was getting like direct messages left and right of people that needed access to things and couldn't find things. Uh -huh. um, so I don't know if you guys Do we have everybody back yet? I'm just checking. Yes, it looks like just everybody is back. Okay. Welcome back. What we're going to do now, uh, for the sake of time, we had originally thought maybe we could have some people share out, but we want to make sure we have time for our expert talk. So you will have access to this Jamboard in order to look at other teachers' ideas, the discussions that were going on in other breakout rooms. But at this point, we'd like to turn things over to uh, Dr. Heather Kamira Heather and uh, let her share what's going on in her lab. Okay, and um, just as Erin was mentioning, uh, the Jamboard is going to be up so you can continue to look at that and see what other people were saying. And then there were people posting um, some questions and we are answering those questions in, in the Jamboard. Um, and one of them specifically was asking about students signing into PBS Learning Media uh, to be able to access things. They shouldn't have to sign in to have a student um, access to see this, that content and to do it. Uh, if you do have sign in, you were able to track them in what they are doing, but that is going to be very much, I think, uh, a tied to the, either your Google Classroom and also your district. Um, so happy to chat more offline if you have further questions about that. And um, I would love to be able to then get to the point where we are introducing our guest speaker today, who she has been with us and listening to the conversation today. Um, she was also in, I think, a breakout room, and we are delighted that Dr. Heather Fumera ha has taken time to spend with us this evening. She is an Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at Binghamton University. Uh, she has her BS in Chemistry from Smith College. She has her PhD in Microbiology from the University of Georgia, and her postdoc postdoctoral research in genetics at Cornell University. And so... We are super thrilled that Heather is with us this evening and Heather has got her presentation up and ready to go. So Heather, welcome, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking with my breakout room, um, learning what you guys are doing. Um, I have a 14 year old son who uh, you know, resists everything as much as a 14 year old son should resist when it comes to doing schoolwork online. Um, I'm really impressed with all that you guys have been doing. I wanna share with you just a couple things about what we do in um, my research lab. And then I actually thought it's late in the day, uh, I was putting some slides together and I thought that we'd turn to some genetics that you might be able to do in your classroom that is so easy and really fun. Okay, so just, I love to talk about my stuff. So let me give me a few slides to do that. And then we'll go into looking at some cat genotypes. Um, Okay, so I study mitochondria, which is, you know, you all know it's the powerhouse of the cell. Um, I hope that, well, if you don't know this, so, you know, we see these cartoons of mitochondria, and really this is a cross section. In a cell, here's a muscle cell. The nucleus, which has all the DNA, all the nuclear DNA is shown in blue. And this red network, that's the mitochondria. It just floods the entire cell, and this is where energy is made. And those little green dots represent mitochondrial DNA. So it's the genetics that are inside the mitochondria. And so you see that 
um, cells have lots and lots of green dots, lots and lots of different mitochondrial DNAs, whereas they just have one big nuclear genome. Okay, and so we're interested in what are the genetics that make good, healthy, strong mitochondria and which ones lead to um, dysfunctional mitochondria. And very quickly, if your mitochondria aren't working well, um, you're gonna have lots of problems, right? These are broad uh, diffuse type of diseases that typically affect muscles, neurodegeneration. It depends what cells are being affected. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different um, diseases that can present. And all of these diseases are fairly rare, but in some, if you take all the different mitochondrial diseases that have been discovered, um, about one in 4,000 people have a mitochondrial disease. So an individual disease might be rare, but collectively mitochondrial diseases are relatively common. Um, we also know that mitochondrial dysfunction um, can, is observed in lots of other diseases that are not considered to be mitochondrial diseases like Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's disease, some heart disease, um, ALS, these have they're not predominantly considered to be a mitochondrial disease, but they do have defects in mitochondrial activity. And so one of the things, one of the many things I'm interested in is um, how all of those, they're cartooned here in blue, but um, here is just a, a picture. Imagine you've got a cell with lots of good, healthy, good mitochondrial DNA. That's each of those spots. You know, maybe you're gonna be a super athlete then if you start to have some mutations in that mitochondrial DNA, some of your copies, maybe you're not gonna be an athlete anymore, you're just gonna be a normal person. And then if you have more and more bad copies, mutant mitochondrial DNAs, that can lead to disease and even death, right? So one of the things that we're interested in is trying to figure out if you've got a cell and it's gonna make a daughter cell, it has to give mitochondrial DNA to that daughter cell. And we're wondering is if can we can we ask a can we ask a cell to promote inheriting certain types of mitochondrial DNA? So when a cell divides, sometimes it's going to give a mixture to its daughter cell. Sometimes it's going to give more copies of the bad mitochondrial DNA, and sometimes it's going to give more copies of the good mitochondrial DNA. And this seems to be fairly random. And what we're trying to do is figure out how we can use genetics to control or to, to facilitate the inheritance of better mitochondrial DNA. So you might have someone who's starting to present a, a, a mitochondrial disease. Maybe we can push them back towards good health if all of this, the daughter cells that their cells are making only give um, healthy mitochondrial DNA to those daughter cells. Okay, and so um, I love this topic that biology repeats itself. We use model organisms because it's too hard to study this just in humans. So, you know, we've got mice and zebrafish and flies, all of these are fantastic model systems. The one that I use in my lab is baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I love it because it smells great when you open the door in the morning, it smells like bread is baking. Um, and the genetics are fantastic. Uh, it also looks very much like human cells. Here's a yeast cell and the red is that red mitochondrial network and all those little yellow spots are the mitochondrial DNA. So we know that it, it kind of has that same mitochondrial network and that we can do experiments quite simply on Petri plates. And this is a Petri plate that shows a bunch of yeast colonies that are growing on the plate. And we started off here with a collection of um, cells that were making daughter cells and they had the option of putting a good mitochondrial DNA or a bad mitochondrial DNA in or a mixture. And what we can see here from a simple plate screen is that the, the white, the big fat healthy colony, that got the good mitochondrial DNA. And then there are some smaller cells, they got the bad mitochondrial DNA. And then there are some medium sized cells, they got a mixture. And so we've been trying to investigate the genetics behind this. And very, I'm summing up everything here. We've used genetic screens and genetic mapping. Um, here's yeast colonies growing on um, high throughput screens, looking under microscopes to look at the inheritance of mitochondrial DNA and lots of sequencing work. And we have found genes that promote asymmetrical mitochondrial DNA inheritance. And we're also looking at environments that promote that transmission of healthy mitochondrial DNAs. So all of this work is in yeast. We're eager to move into 
higher eukaryotes. We're also very interested in how um, mitochondrial DNA inheritance um, promotes the evolution of not just yeast, but other organisms. Um, everybody, all mammals have mitochondrial DNA. All eukaryotes have mitochondrial DNA. So that sums up really quickly the, the type of work that we do in the lab. If you're interested in learning more about this, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'd love to work with um, students that are interested in doing something. Maybe we could get some projects going up. What I thought would be fun for us to do um, is to do something that I do when I teach uh, genetics um, in, at, at the university. On the first day, we usually do um, genotype to phenotype predictions. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump here. Okay, so I think you saw these slides, right? The, the idea behind genetic testing is that you spit in a cup, they sequence or look at your DNA, and from that, they can predict your health, they can pre predict your ancestry. And so we can work backwards too, right? We can start with phenotypes, that which we observe, and predict what our DNA should, should, should be. And so this is something that you might be interested in, depending on what level you're teaching at. So we do some cat genetics. And the type of learning objectives that um, are easy to implement is to define the difference between genotype that you know, the genetics underlying something versus the phenotype, that's which, that which you observe. And then you can predict genotypes by looking at the phenotypes. And you can use this to introduce some genetic concepts like the idea that you've got a, um, two copies of every chromosome. Mammals are diploids. We have two copies of each chromosome. Um, and you can introduce terms like dominant and recessive co-dominance, incompletely dominant, and sex-linked traits. So um, we've got these cats here. And the question is, um, we've got some phenotypes that you can see. Can we predict what the genotypes, what can't you see? What's the genetic basis behind this? And if any of you have a cat, go get it, right? We can genotype it right now. Like some of you are sitting at home. If you want to share your cat, we can do some genetics on your cat. Um, so when I look at these cats, Here's a picture. We've got two cats. They have um, different hair lengths. They've got stripes or no stripes, and they've got coat color. Okay, and so from by looking at these three traits, we can um, do some pretty simple learning. Okay, so first, let's look at hair length. So hair length, long-haired or short-haired cats, that's controlled by a single gene, and there are two versions of that gene. And one version leads to short hair and one version leads to long hair. Short hair is dominant. So if you have a cat that has two copies of each chromosome, it's gonna have the short hair version, the dominant, we call it big L, um, on at least one of those chromosomes. The other chromosome is either gonna have a big L or it's gonna have a little L, right? So the genotype of a short haired cat we're either gonna be big L, big L, or big L, little L, where the big L is the dominant short-haired version. Long-haired cats, long hair is a recessive trait. So we know that if you've got a long-haired cat, their two chromosomes are gonna have two copies. Each of the chromosomes is gonna have this short hair version of the, of the chromosome. So there we go. Long-haired cats have, we've predicted the genotype of little L, little L. Let's look at stripes. Okay. So striping is caused by a gene called agouti. And this is an, a, a dominant form of this gene, agouti, um, leads to striping. And really what it leads to is you have a single hair that has two different colors on the single hair. So any of you have a dog or a cat, if you pull out a single hair, if you see different colors on that hair, they have the dominant version of that agouti gene. So in cats, all striped cats have to have this dominant version of the gene. We call it big A, right? So the big A agouti. So a striped cat is either going to be big A and big A on their two chromosomes, or they're going to be big A and little a, a simple dominant recessive relationship. A cat that is solid colored, doesn't matter what color it is, as long as it's just no stripes, it's going to, that's a recessive version of the gene, and we call it little a. So both chromosomes have to have that little a, little a. Okay, cool. So now we can do hair length and we can do stripes. 
Let's talk about sex-linked traits and co-dominant traits. Okay, so um, hopefully you rem remember that females always have two X chromosomes and males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And that's the standard in all mammals. So that's in humans, it's in dogs, it's in cats. Um, so on the X chromosome, there's actually a gene that controls the coat color in cats. And that gene is either gonna lead to a cat that has an orange color, or it's gonna lead to a cat that has a black color. So if you have the version of that gene, we're gonna call it XO, so it's on the X chromosome and it's the O version, you're gonna have an orange cat. And if it's got the B version, it's gonna be a black cat. So this is really fun to look at. Um, we can predict the genotypes of cats by looking at their color. So if you have a cat that's completely orange, then that cat is either gonna be a male or a female. If it's a male, it has to have, it has one X chromosome and it has to have, it has to have the orange version of the gene. If it has two, if it's a female, both X chromosomes have to have that orange allele and that's how you get an orange cat, okay? Similarly, you can have the black version of the gene, the black allele of the gene, and females, an all black female cat will have two X chromosomes, both of which have the B, black version of the gene, and males have one X chromosome and that has the black version of the gene. So what happens when you have a female cat that has two X chromosomes, one has the O orange gene, and the other has the other version of that gene, which leads to black color, XB. You have, um, we call this heterozygous. We have an XO and an XB. And that's how we get cats that have both orange and black, right? And so here's another orange and black. Both of these cats have this genotype. We can predict by looking at their coat color, oh, orange and black, they must have a version of the O and a version of the black. And because we can see both orange and black, it's not a dominant or recessive relationship, they're co-dominant. We can see both phenotypes, right? So we can use this as an example of co-dominance. So I always get this question, well, I have a cat that's gray. I have a cat that's buff colored. It's not really orange or black. And I'm, I'm like, yes, um, actually all cats are orange or black. Um, some fancy breeds are a little bit different, but most cats, you either are orange or black. Then there's a second gene that um, produces how much of that color is presented. So um, this is a dominant recessive relationship. There's a gene. If you have the dominant version of the gene, it's dark, it's presenting lots of the color. So you get intensely orange or intensely black cats, intensely colored cats. If you have the recessive versions of the gene, little d, then you don't make as much color. You still make orange, but not as much. And so a, an orange cat that has this recessive dilute gene becomes buff colored. And a black cat that has the recessive dilute genes is gray, right? So all of us that have gray cats, they're really black cats that aren't making a lot of the black color. So they're gray. Isn't that fun? I think that's so fun. Okay. So, okay, we've got orange and black and gray. And now we need to know about white, right? So people are always like, but my cat has orange and black and white. Well, it turns out white, it's not really a color. It's the absence of color. And this is a great example of incomplete dominance. And so white spotting, okay, it's also called piebald spotting. Um, just let me tell you a little bit about the development of this. So the color um, is produced in cells called melanocytes. And during development, the melanocytes start in the, the brain and then they extend down the spinal cord. And finally they wrap all around until they're like cover the whole belly. And so this is a mouse embryo that is showing um, the blue spots here are the melanocytes. They've been dyed in a blue color. And so you can see an intense spot here in the brain, and then it extends kind of down the spinal cord. Um, and then if you blow that up, you can even see the little tiny blue dots there. Those are the melanocytes. Those are the cells that are gonna make the color that um, lead to the coat color. Um, 
if you have a mutation in, and this is controlled, the, move, the movement of those cells is controlled by a gene called the spotting gene. And if you have a normal version of the spotting gene, which we can call S plus, then all of those cells will cover the entire surface of the, the, the animal. If you have a mutant version of the, um, of the spotting gene, S minus, then it doesn't completely block the movement, but it sure slows it down. And so those melanocytes aren't very effective at coating the entire um, surface of the animal. So what happens is that if you have a cat that has two copies of the normal spotting gene, then those melanocytes, they traffic just fine. They cover the entire coat of the cat or the, uh, the entire skin and the cat is fully colored. All, there's no white whatsoever. If you have one good copy of the gene and one bad copy of the gene, one mutant form, then the melanocytes, they travel, but they don't completely cover the stomach. Um, and so you end up with a cat that has color in about half of the body, but not the other half. And so if, you're, if you see a cat that's about half white, and this is a pretty loose number here, but 50% or less white, then you know it probably has one functional copy of the, of the spotting gene and one non-functional copy, right? So tuxedo cats um, are classic uh, heterozygotes. They've got one mutant copy of that spotting gene. Then we can have a cat that has two mutant copies and the melanocytes don't travel very well. You do get some migration. So you end up with a cat that's, if it's more than half white, then it probably has two mutant versions of that spotting gene. And so this is incompletely dominant because the, the heterozygote, the middle guy, it's not one thing or the other. You're somewhere in between. You're not fully colored and you're not fully white. You're somewhere in between incompletely dominant. Okay. So anyone have their cat? Anyone want to share? Come on. Don't I leave. tried. Mine wouldn't stay. <laughs> no cat. No Sarah cat. She has hers. I have a cat here. All right. Where are you? Derek. Derek. Oh, perfect. Look at this beauty. Yeah, he's very willing to uh, take part in this experiment. Um, okay. But I think we've, I think I figured everything out. So he's a long hair, so he's got the recessive. Yes. Um, Eric, what's your cat's name? Ah, uh, this is Silas. Cyrus. Silas. Come here. Now be nice. How do, how do we even spell that? S I L A S. Silas. Okay. So Silas is long haired. Yes. And so what is his genotype? So he's uh, two lowercase, he's homozygous recessive. Yep, he's little l, little l. Yep. And let's say he is, um, he is black. Uh, is well, it's interesting because he's kind of like a Maine Coon. And I don't know, when you were describing it, I actually looked at him like a diluted calico. Because he's got like the, the yellow, what I thought of as yellow, I guess. Yeah. So does he have some Maine Coon in him? He, he's definitely, I he's, would say, a Maine Coon. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes the purebred um, beautiful cats, uh, their genetics have been manipulated in ways, you know, we selected for, for weird things when we select for breeds. And so sometimes the color doesn't, like the, the traits that I showed you, don't always apply to purebred oh, cats. Yeah. Um, but we know he's male, right? So we can give him an X and a Y pretty confidently. Yes. And he's mostly black, right? Or black or gray. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? And so he's probably X, B, Y. And because he's a purebred, he probably has some other genes that influence that color a little bit because genetics are complicated. Right? Okay. So yeah, I think that we can pretty confidently say that he is um, a black male cat, right? Long hair black. Is he striped at all? Uh, yes, he definitely got stripes. So he would be, let's so see he here, the cap, he would be the dominant, the capital A. 
if he's A, and then we don't know he's either big A, big A, or he's big A, little A. What else does he have? Um, let's see. So he's got, you know, like a white chest. Uh, so I would say it's definitely less than 50 50, but it's, uh, it seems like he would be, let's see here. What would he be? Uh, the S plus S minus. Yeah, he's probably got a good copy of the genes, mostly colored, but he's got some white, so not fully, those, the, that S gene isn't working completely as, as well. So he's incompletely dominant, piebald, it's that spotting, white and, spotting. And in terms of the migration you were, you were describing in terms of the fetal development, is that why paws are frequently white? Yeah, so um, we see a lot of black and white cats, and you always see the the black is usually on the head, maybe the back and on the tail. And it's kind of like the last things that go through development, like the melanocytes have to get all the way to the feet. Sometimes they don't make it that far. And so you end up with nice white paws with white mittens. You never see a white cat with black mittens. Yeah. If you ever find one, bring it to me. I got to see that, right? Because that would be rarely, there we go. There's Garfield. <laughs> right? So. Fantastic. The other um, trait that we can look at here is that um, he is a uh, fairly strongly colored black, so he's not dilute. Oh, okay. All There's right. That, that other gene. And so that was throwing me off, I guess, when you were saying that they either had to be orange or black or calico, because um, he's not all black. It almost seems like there's a yellowishness to him, but. Yeah, I think that might be because of the, of the purebred. And there are a lot of genes, we call them modifier genes. You have genes that have the main effect and then other genes that will come in and kind of change that a little bit, um, which is why genetics is so, uh, like we have some simple examples that we talk about, Mendel's, peas and things like that. But most traits in biology are not as clear cut as you know one gene, one effect. Um, so, uh, these were just, that was, that's something that I do with my students and everyone loves that. Um, so I thought that you might enjoy, you might enjoy that, be able to use that. Um, yeah, I think this would be a good extra credit project to get my students grades up by uh, the end of the quarter, so. Yeah, awesome, awesome. They love show and tell with cats. That's our, their favorite part of any Google Meet that we have is uh, <laughs> let's all bring our cats and I'll show them. <laughs> that's very good. Um, yeah, if, I've got some sheets written up for this. If you want to contact me, I can send you um, my information that I have oh, to share it with my great. students. Um, yeah, and, and you know, if you want to make these more complicated, you can do things like you can add, um, if you want to do a cross, a monohybrid cross, what happens if you cross two cats that have, I don't know, like what happens if you have this, these two cats mate? What, how many kittens do you expect to be all black or, you know, and you can, you can play with these kind of things. So that's what we do kind of in the first week of, of the college genetics class that we do. And students love this. They talk about it all semester and they talk about it at the end of the semester when I say, what did you, what will you take with you forever? And they're like, cat genotypes, like, cause everyone loves their cat. <laughs> so very good. Dr. Okay. Kamara, there's just a, a question for clarification in the chat. Um, on the dominant trait, gets the capital letter. So would the short hair be capital S and the long hair would be lowercase s instead of using uh, the L? Um, so the whether you call it a big L or a little L, the, the name, those letters that we give, those are arbitrary letters. Every geneticist will use different letters. There's some of them that are by convention. But you are correct that the, the dominant allele, the dominant version of the gene is usually the cap, they put it as a capital letter. And whether it's a big S or a little S, um, I tend to try to avoid S's with, because when students write a big S and a little S, it doesn't look at all different. And then they say, I wrote dominant S, but it looks no different. So, <coughs> excuse me, I try to use um, letters that I can tell the difference between a capital and a lowercase. Um, there we go. But uh, did I answer that question? Yes, thank you. L would be length though, right? That's why <laughs> you chose L because it's length is the trait and the two options are short and long. So yeah. is that why you chose L? That is why I chose L. Mm -hmm. 
that is why I chose L. Um, so we have a good time with this. Um, I thought you might as well. And I thought that one might be a, a more fun way to uh, talk about genetics rather than talk about, I love mitochondria. I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, but when I was pre preparing some slides, my 14 year old was like, you're really gonna tell them about mitochondria? <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll bring the cats. <laughs> so. Uh, Dr. Kumar, there's another question. Would fur color and coat color intensity fall under uh, epistasis? Yeah, it's a good question. And it, it's, um, I have an epistasis example. So epistasis is this uh, topic when you have one gene suppresses the effect of another gene. And so yes, the dilute gene, it, it changes the phenotype that happens because of the other gene. So we've got this coat color gene that's black or orange, and then we have this other gene that is changing that color a little bit, right? And so it is an example of an epistasis. Another example of epistasis is often um, a cat that is all white can be caused by a big white spot. In fact, most cats that you see that are all white are really just, they're actually a colored cat that have one giant white spot that covers their entire body, right? Um, uh, but sometimes there are cats that are all white because of a gene, um, a, a dominant mutation in a gene that will just abbreviate W. This is quite rare. And this gene masks the effect, it prevents the development of all pigment. And so it doesn't matter, here's this white cat that has this big W dominant um, gene, it's rare. And because of this, we don't know if this cat actually is a black or an orange cat. We don't know if he's striped or not striped. We don't know if he's dilute or not dilute, right? Because this white dominant white gene masks the effect of that. That's this topic of epistasis. And so, um, yeah, we do, uh, that dilute is, that is a great example of epistasis. And um, the dominant is also an, an example of epistasis. It's also an example of the, the word pleiotropy. So pleiotropy is when you have one gene that leads to multiple different phenotypes, right? And so this dominant trait, um, not only leads to a white color, but cats that have this big W gene, big W version of the gene, they're often deaf and they often will have two different colored eyes, right? So here you have three different traits, coat color, eye blind, you know, eye color and deafness. And that's all, all, all caused by the same gene, that's biotropy. So I'm looking in the chat here, can cat coats change color due to environmental factors such as cold temperatures? So in special breeds, in Siamese cats, um, yes, the color develops during its temperature. And it actually has to do not just with temperature, but with how the cells migrate during a particular time that is related to temperature. So that doesn't happen in most, just like your barn cats go to the SPCA. Um, color, uh, temperature isn't going to change that, but for Siamese cats, definitely. Um, that's thing. Um, I've heard that you get your mitochondrial from your mother and that everyone has the same mitochondrial DNA. Is there any truth in this? Yes, we inherit as mammals, we inherit our mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. Big egg cell, tiny little sperm that swims up, buries into this big egg cell. The egg is carrying all that mitochondrial DNA. So um, what we are learning is that the mitochondrial DNA that we inherited from our mother, it's not always all one it's not all the same version. We might get a hundred copies from our mother and it might have 80 versions of one particular sequence and 20% have a different sequence, slightly different sequence, just some variation. Um, so there's definitely truth in that. And uh, that can lead to, if you inherit, if you look at mitochondrial pedigrees, you can see that you'll have someone who's affected. They have terrible mitochondrial DNA, but they'll have a child that has, that has no, observable phenotype. And it's because by chance, they happen to get more copies of the good mitochondrial DNA than the bad, right? Um, so uh, 
yellow Labrador retrievers, there's a whole great different stories about what controls the coat colors in um, Labrador retrievers. I use that as a great example for, um, there's a lot of gene interactions that happen. Um, and uh, the Labrador chocolate labs, black labs and yellow labs, um, the genetics behind that are really fun. We could talk about. Um, Karen writes, what are the implications of producing healthier mitochondrial DNA over time with this slow aging? Oh, wonderful question. Um, that, yes, that we know that as we age, um, we tend to develop more um, mutants, mutant copies of our mitochondrial DNA. And that can lead to uh, poor mitochondrial function. And so there is certainly, um, hypotheses that if we could prevent mitochondrial mutations, can we prevent aging? There's great debate as to whether aging leads to mutations or mutations in the mitochondrial DNA lead to aging. I think it's pretty clear that the more mutations you get in your mitochondrial DNA, the more detrimental health you have. So if we could prevent mitochondrial damage, I'm not going to say we would, we would, it's not going to be the elixir the, the stop aging altogether, but we might be able to slow the process down. We might be healthier for longer, right? So, and how does mitochondrial DNA go bad? Um, random mutation is a lot of it, right? Environmental, we can, um, we can uh, so oxidative damage can lead to mutations in the mitochondrial DNA. So if you have uh, oxidative stress, and that stress leads to oxygen radicals that damage DNA. If that damage occurs in the mitochondria and you um, uh, damage your mitochondrial DNA because of this environmental factor, um, that, that certainly can lead to more mitochondrial mutations. There was a big push for a long time. Make sure you take your antioxidants, right? And you could buy these like uh, supplements to get rid of all the oxidative, oxidative things in, that you eat, like take these antioxidants. It turns out that we need to have some of those oxidizing agents to prime our mitochondria so that we know how to respond to stresses when they occur. So it's kind of like exercising. You want to have some level of stress. You want to have some fitness that you, you want to have something that your mitochondria is responding to so that when they get hit with a really big stress, they're ready. Um, it's kind of like you sit on a couch and then all of a sudden you have to run a marathon. You can't do it. So we need to keep our mitochondria active. So my advice is eat your blueberries, eat well, but don't overload on the antioxidants. It's probably going to have more harm than good, right? So um, yeah, that, there have been some fun uh, mitochondrial meetings that I've gone to that have really promoted like, please stop taking these antioxidants. Just eat well. <laughs> That's probably the best thing you could do. Um, so how often does mitochondria come from the sperm? This is a great question. So um, every now and then you'll see a report that uh, you have a, someone who inherited their father's mitochondrial DNA, okay? Um, how frequently does that happen? Not that frequently. The best thing about genetics is mistakes happen all the time. So now that we do so much sequencing, we're discovering those mistakes but I still think that they are mistakes. Those are rare things. What happens most likely is you've got this big egg cell and a sperm. I'm gonna stop my share for a second so I can see more of you at least. Um, you've got this big egg cell and a sperm you know, swims up to it and buries itself in the side. There are mechanisms that try to degrade the tail um, but every now and then one mitochondria, so that tail has, needs a lot of energy to be able to swim up to the egg. And so if that tail of a sperm is just chock full of mitochondria. And so every now and then one mitochondrial DNA from the sperm will get into the egg and maybe it shows up and you can find it in a human, right? So I think that does happen. I think it's a relatively rare event. Um, let's see, I'm looking. Um, can we get your cat genes lessons? Yeah. Um, what's the, what's the easiest way? Maybe I could send them to Nancy. Do you want to just send out an email to everybody? Okay. I'll do that. I'll do that. 
Um, can I explain a little bit about the vast variations in the mitochondrial genomes within one cell? Okay, so um, sure, we have these mitochondrial DNAs and they all contain the same number of genes. Uh, and it's just like when you inherit something from your mom and something from your dad, you get the same genes, but sometimes you get different versions of those genes. And so the mitochondrial DNA, you can have different versions of those genes. Most of the time, um, or I should say most versions of the genes work fine, right? It's only these rare mutations that lead to really um, severe you know, health phenotypes. But different versions of the genes might have just slightly different mitochondrial fitness, right? Um, I don't know quite how to, to talk about that more. Um, there are, we, I guess 10 years ago, 20 years ago, everybody thought that if you had a good mitochondrial DNA, that's all you needed. No one cared about differences between mitochondrial DNAs. We now know that differences between mitochondrial DNAs certainly affect mitochondrial health. Now, whether that leads you to become a marathon runner versus someone who can walk to the mailbox and back, I don't know. No one really knows that. Um, certainly the environment that you put your cells in is going to have a bigger influence on your mitochondrial health than small differences in mitochondrial DNA. And so we are exploring what the different variations in mitochondrial DNA can mean for the overall fitness of um, mitochondrial health and how that might influence evolution is a big thing that we're looking at in our lab. And then Alan writes, homo sapiens have been around a while and mitochondrial DNA is sequence is small. Wouldn't mitochondrial DNA have all gone bad by now by just randomly mutating? Yeah, there are thousands of mitochondria in some cells. This mitochondrial DNA has self-repair systems. So if mitochondrial DNA is really bad, you won't live and you won't pass on too many of those really mutant copies so there's a lot of selection against really bad copies of mitochondrial DNA. So we do accumulate copies of mitochondrial DNA. Um, sometimes we pass them on. Sometimes they get more and more mutations and they get really bad. But when they get so bad, there's going to be serious health defects. And we're going to select for that over, we're going to select against that over evolutionary timeframes. So there's a lot of selection against really bad copies of mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA may have some um, repair systems, and that's active areas of research to try to understand how mitochondrial DNA fixes itself. Um, it's not as well understood as how nuclear DNA fixes itself. That's great. We've got time for maybe one more question. Did we get through everything in the chat, Dr. Kamara? I think we did. I think so. I think so. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank this you. Was, this was really great. I loved, I loved the cats. <laughs> Everybody does love the cats. Okay. So I will send I'll send Nancy the information I have about cats and she can um, she can email the, the list here. And if anyone wants to reach out to me and ask any specific questions, I'm more than happy to to talk to you guys about how you can use some of this stuff. Um, That's thank wonderful. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. OK, as we're getting close to wrapping up. Uh, we've got a couple more things to go over. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. That was amazing. Really wonderful information. And I love the how you can just turn key and use some of this right into your into your classroom. Um, and Dr. Fumera is a she's wonderful and she she's right in our backyard at Binghamton University. If you haven't signed up for Thursday session, um, there's still time to sign up. Uh, we will be doing another session on Thursday at 4:30. And it's going to be genome editing and CRISPR. So it's going to be uh, a different different session. Uh, we still will be using PBS Learning me Media resources and showing you how to use those right in your classroom. And Maureen has 
popped in, oh, she's popped in um, Dr. Fumero's uh, lab website as well. So that her contact information is in there. Thank you, Maureen. Um, if you haven't signed up for Thursday's session, I'm going to pop into the link, um, my learning plan. And so that is so that you get your CTLE credits, or if you're a master teacher, I'm going to pop that in there too, because you have different ways to register and worry. Nancy, about. I, I got it yeah. in there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so if you're a master teacher, there's a link for you to register that way. If you are, are not and you want your CTLE credits, uh, go through my learning plan. We still have room for you for that session. Uh, both sessions are being recorded. And one last thing I would like to ask um, for, of you this evening is that this was made possible uh, through some grant funds through PBS. And I've just popped a survey link into the chat. I know everybody loves a good survey, but it's really helpful if you are able to take a moment and complete that survey. Um, it lets people know, lets our funders know that people actually attended our workshop and um, what, what you learned from that. So I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, I will also be sending that survey link out in an email as well. Uh, just in case, you know, you need to run off and do other things. We totally understand. Yay, John likes PBS Passport. <laughs> it's a good, that's a, it's a great tool. Um, the Gene, the documentary is available in full on PBS Learning Media. WSKG will be re-airing that for our special in February. So on Sunday, February 7th at six o'clock, we will air the first part. And then on Sunday, February 14th, at six o'clock, we will be airing the second piece of that. So if you wanted to catch it, it'll be on WSKG. I'd like to thank Dr. Hadley Fumira for your time and expertise tonight. It was really wonderful uh, being able to, to have you join us. Thank you so much. Thank you to Maureen Smith. Thank you, Aaron Deegan and Jessica Schindler for all of your expertise and, and sharing content with us tonight. And we look forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Jeff Bradloff and Dr. Dominic Fanacone on Thursday. So thank you everybody for joining us this evening and we hope you have a great night.